Five Nights at Freddy's, the indie horror game that took the internet by storm back in 2014. This game's influence became so pervasive that it grew beyond gamers to reach artists, animators, and even musicians. Perhaps the greatest testament to this game's massive popularity is how it inspired thousands of fans to create their own versions of the game, with some of these fan games arguably being scarier than the source material. This game even affected me. The trailer for Five Nights at Freddy's 2 is what introduced me to the series. I remember immediately buying and playing the first game after re-watching it a couple thousand times. My experiences playing the first two games are actually what made me want to start a YouTube channel in the first place. However, in recent years, the series has seemingly strayed very far from its roots. This has led many to question, what made Five Nights at Freddy's actually scary? Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gaming Scariest, the series where we dissect your favorite horror games to find out what it is about them that makes your skin crawl. What made Five Nights at Freddy's actually scary? To properly answer this question, I'm only going to be dissecting the original trilogy of games, as I believe they not only lay the foundation for every game afterward, but also tell the series' core story. So with that out of the way, sit back, relax, and allow me to tell you how Five Nights at Freddy's uses your own nostalgia against you. In games 1 through 3, you play as a security guard tasked with keeping track of the animatronics who mysteriously walk around at night. If you get caught, they'll most likely see you as a metal endoskeleton without its costume on. They'll probably try to forcefully stuff you inside a Freddy Fazbear suit, so you can imagine how having your head forcefully pressed inside one of those could cause a bit of discomfort and death. Survive five nights, and maybe two more for good measure, and you get your paycheck. Simple. However, as most of you know, there's more to this game than meets the eye. After pressing New Game in Five Nights 1, you're immediately dropped into your office. As you sit there, you get the feeling that something about this place just isn't quite right. As your paranoia begins to rise, you flip through the cameras, looking at all of the different features of the building. It's here that I want to touch on three main locations. The main stage, containing the three main animatronics, the empty dining area, and finally, the curtain-drawn Pirate's Cove. These areas could easily be described as liminal spaces. For those of you unaware, liminal spaces are areas that are usually bustling with life, but now since silent and empty. If you've been on the internet lately, you've probably seen countless videos of people exploring these kinds of places. Liminal spaces can be anywhere. An empty classroom, an old arcade, an empty parking lot, each of these places may elicit a sense of nostalgia from the viewer, even if you've never set foot there before. The same principle can be applied to Five Nights at Freddy's. Even if you never went to a Chuck E. Cheese style restaurant as a child, these images can fool your brain into reminiscing about days gone by. You can almost hear the sounds of children playing, the music booming, arcade games beeping. <laughs> You're dragged back down to reality as a sharp ring of the telephone cuts through the noisy office. The man on the other side informs you that this isn't your typical graveyard shift, and that any nostalgic fantasy should be left at the door. This job is a fight for survival. They're coming for you. As the phone call ends, you're left with an impending sense of doom. You frantically check the main stage, only to see the animatronics staring at you through the camera. Your only way of tracking them is then suddenly cut off by garbled static. Panicked, you look to the doors, your only means of defense. It's then that you notice the drawings on the office wall. The longer you stare at them, the more soulless and sinister they become. Within just a few seconds, your childhood nostalgia has turned into horror. As you sit in your office, you begin to take in the sounds around you. 
You hear the sounds of the office light buzzing loudly, along with the ominous ambiance echoing in the background. But it's then that you hear a different sound. The original Five Nights at Freddy's is a masterclass in how to create a horrifying atmosphere. You're first presented with a familiar image of a local party place, but something is wrong with it. Instead of being filled with life and joy, the building is shrouded in darkness. That, coupled with the iconic haunting sound design, creates an extremely disturbing experience. These key features allow Five Nights at Freddy's to excel at this twisted nostalgia. But what about the other two games? How do they compare? When compared to the original, the atmosphere of Five Nights 2 comes across as much quieter and eerie rather than haunting like its predecessor. In contrast, the visuals of the game are pretty similar. To some, it would be easy to write FNAF 2 off as just FNAF 1 but with more animatronics. However, this would be doing this game a massive disservice. If you look around the pizzeria, you'll notice odd things like water puddles on the floor and stains on the walls. Odd, seeing as you're led to believe that this iteration of Freddy's has just recently opened. This is, until you receive a call from Phone Guy on Night 6. Hello, hello. Uh, what on earth are you doing there? Uh, didn't you get the memo? Uh, the place is closed down, at least for a while. You're working at an abandoned location. The building you're currently working at was abruptly evacuated during one final birthday party for undisclosed reasons, leading the animatronics to wander the empty hallways you now watch over. This environment and storyline employs a slightly different technique than the original game. Unlike its predecessor, where paranoia twisted your nostalgia into horror, FNAF 2 twists something called Enemoia. Enemoia is different from nostalgia in that it causes you to long for a time you never experienced in any capacity. If you've ever watched an old movie and found yourself missing the era depicted, that's Enemoia. FNAF 2 uses Anamoya to make the player feel more like a spectator looking in on dark events that occurred long ago. This frozen in time aesthetic causes the building to feel like some sort of cursed time capsule, one that you accidentally opened. This is further emphasized by the different death minigames you play throughout the game. Through these minigames, you see different grisly events from the past depicted in Atari S graphics. The phrase, save them, save them, is echoed through each sequence, but you soon realize, you can't. Although the gameplay of FNAF 2 becomes more and more chaotic as the nights go on, the different components from both the narrative and atmosphere come together to create an eerie game filled with disturbing secrets and mysteries that play with your mind, but every dark tale has its conclusion. In Five Nights at Freddy's 3, we're greeted by an old, crusty-looking building. Instead of a family restaurant, we find ourselves working inside of a horror attraction based around the murders that occurred inside Freddy Fazbear's all those years ago. FNAF 3 uses the twisted nostalgia technique slightly differently than the previous two entries. Instead of causing us to recall a time that we may or may not have experienced in real life, it makes us reflect upon all of the terrible things we've seen across the prior two games. By this point, you've seen the murders as they happened, you've witnessed the animatronics become possessed, and you've been to the small rundown pizzeria overrun with angry spirits. Now, years later, this is all that's left. If you look around the establishment, you'll notice familiar children's drawings, taken from both FNAF 1 and 2's respective locations. Alongside them are a few old posters featuring members of our favorite animatronic band. These small details offer windows into the history of Freddy's before all of the pain and misfortune that we know took place there long ago, triggering small doses of twisted nostalgia from FNAF 1 and slight hints of animoia from FNAF 2. To put even further emphasis on how much has changed since our first night at Freddy's, 
let's take a look at the empty suits that sit in the corners and ends of each hallway. They're the same costumes as the original animatronics, but they've been reduced to empty husks, mere props and blinking lights. By FNAF 3, the spirits have long since had their happiest day and moved on. Now, it's just you. just you, and the one behind it all. Five Nights at Freddy's has gone through a sort of renaissance in the last year or two. You've most likely seen video after video of people analyzing different features of the games to answer the question of why those certain aspects were scary or unnerving. In my opinion, it isn't the jump scares or even the creepy sounds that make the first three games terrifying. It's the reoccurring theme that pleasant childhood experiences can be so easily turned against you. Something sinister corrupting what was once pure and innocent, leaving nothing but emptiness behind is a terrifying concept, but one everyone grapples with to different degrees as they grow older. However, we should all hold tightly to the good times we had as children. We may face harsh realities every day, perhaps even twisted reflections of past delights, but it's only when you let go of every little happy memory that you get a bad ending. <laughs>